In the heart of St. Petersburg stands a statue commemorating one of the most fascinating and powerful rulers ever. Everything about her life and reign was extraordinary, and it's with good reason that she's known to this day as Catherine the Great. She wanted to demonstrate that she was the richest, the grandest, the most powerful of them all. She was an outsider who plotted her way to the very top of the Russian Empire. She seized the throne from her husband, killed him, and then held on to power for 34 years, changing Russia forever. Brilliant at the exercise of power, ruthless um, in public life. Even her sex life was remarkable. Something about me admires her enormously. I mean, she had more lovers after the menopause than before. Hollywood has seized on that part of her story many times and added a few details of its own in the process. There's even a shocking story about the way she died, which has fascinated and horrified people for centuries. It's a gruesome and nude story, and certainly the first thing that most people will tell you about Catherine Great. I think someone probably told me, you know, in the fifth form, and my eyes were agog, sort of going, really? But her story is better than any fiction, packed as it is with all the best ingredients. Power, passion, truth. The accent may be a bit dubious, but you get the point. The girl who was to become Russia's most famous empress was actually German. And she wasn't called Catherine either. She was born Princess Sophia, daughter to a minor German prince from Stettin. She might have remained a complete nobody, but the family had some all-important connections. To the Russian Imperial Court. In 1744, the Empress Elizabeth summoned the teenage princess to Russia. Her purpose? To find a wife for her nephew and heir, so that the great Romanov dynasty might continue. It was the, um, perhaps the best outcome for a young girl of good family as she was. You tried to marry uh, into royalty if you could. And if they invited you, you did the best and tried to make it work. Princess Sophia arrived in St. Petersburg, home of the Russian court, barely 15. She would never leave Russia again. She was very comely, she was very small, she had auburn tresses, and everyone said that she was in fact rather beautiful when she arrived. She immediately distinguished herself by her tact and her grace and charm. She knew instinctively how to act towards people. The same could not be said of Catherine's future husband, Grand Duke Peter. She later wrote, He was 16, quite good-looking before the pox but small and infantile, talking of nothing but soldiers and toys. I listened politely and often yawned, but did not interrupt him. He did have a terrible upbringing. One of the things that uh, Peter's teacher used to do was to make him kneel on dried peas. Well, I don't know if you've ever tried kneeling on dried peas for any length of time, but it's not exactly comfortable. Peter was obsessed with the military and constantly wore a uniform, but it was little more than dressing up. He was a puny armchair soldier who never saw a battlefield. He used to have a, entertain his Holstein officers, you know, to beer and pipes in the evening, and of course that wasn't her cup of tea at all. Uh, she liked reading and, and uh, theatre and, uh, in, well, intelligent conversation. <laughs> He hated Russian traditions and Russian culture. He made no effort to learn Russian. He made no effort to make himself popular at court. 
She was careful to learn Russian, to win the sympathy of the domestic staff that she had to deal with in the palace. Peter too had grown up in Germany, but he clung to his roots and his Lutheran religion. Catherine embraced Russia completely by converting to orthodoxy and taking a new Russian name, Ekaterina. In spite of being totally unsuited, the couple did as they were told and tied the knot. They set up home in Peter's country palace. Their wedding night set the tone for the emotional wilderness that Catherine's marriage turned out to be. She waited in her bed for her husband to come. He never did, and she could hear him carousing downstairs with his friends. He was every woman's nightmare, I think. He was thoroughly immature and unaware of the effects of his actions on other people, and the first person affected was Catherine herself. It's even doubted whether the marriage was ever consummated. Rumour had it that Peter was impotent. Certainly his bedroom activity was largely limited to his playing with his toy soldiers and other childish behaviour. Grand Duke Peter was a man who punished a rat for eating some of his toy soldiers by hanging it in his wife's bedroom from a noose uh, with a board attached to it that said, punished for infringing military procedures. I would have been prepared to like my new husband had he been capable of affection or willing to show any. But in the very first days of our marriage, I came to a sad conclusion about him. I said to myself, if you allow yourself to love that man, you will be the unhappiest creature on earth. This man scarcely looks at you, talks of nothing but dolls or such things, and pays more attention to any other woman than yourself. Catherine escaped from the loveless marriage through one of her passions, riding. I rode like mad all day. No one stopped me and I could break my neck if I wished. No one interfered with me or cared. It seems that the Grand Duke may suffer from a certain physical disability. Well, go on. I believe in medical parlance a condition is called Formosa. The devil in medical parlance, what's the effect of it? Um, the effect is to prevent... Uh, that is to say, to make it impossible for His Highness... You mean he can't? Precisely, ma'am. Catherine's first lover was taken in the interest of the state. If Peter could not father an heir, then someone else would have to. Saltikov. The Empress has chosen well. And that's how an obscure nobleman called Sergei Saltikov came to be the first of Catherine the Great's lovers, and probably the father of the Romanov dynasty. Praise God! It's a boy! No! It's my child! Her duty done, Catherine's son was immediately taken away from her to be brought up by the Empress. She had a complete dolt of a husband, and if she was to have the kind of life that she wanted, which was both, both prosperous and interesting, uh, then she was going to have to do something about it herself. He was a weakling, and I think she, the, 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 in the power relationship between them, he sensed that she was stronger, and she sensed it too. No. If I rule, I rule alone. Never did two minds resemble each other less than ours. I loved reading, so did he, but what did he read? Stories of highwaymen or novels that were not to my taste. 
While Peter was reading trashy novels, Catherine devoured books on philosophy, history, political writings, all the books that might prepare a ruler for power, in fact. And she developed very early on the kind of political skills that were to prove extremely useful to her when she came to the throne. The ability to juggle one faction against another, to balance one advisor against another. Most of all, she knew how to charm. Oh boy, didn't she? All the descriptions of her, her charm, her kindness. She would give her hand to somebody. She would raise them. She would embrace them, kiss them on both cheeks. Mwah, mwah. Oh my. I persisted more and more in my desire to win the affection of the unimportant as well as of the great, neglecting no one and making it a rule to believe that I needed everybody. Accordingly, I behaved in such a way as to win general approval, and in this I succeeded. I came to tell you that the Empress is dead. Dead? Finished? 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 Grand Duke Peter finally got his hands on the throne in 1761. The last person he wanted at his side was his clever, popular wife. There were rumours of divorce. Catherine needed an ally. Gregory Orloff, at your service, madam. Gregory Orlov was a very useful lover. Not only was he a well-built, handsome soldier, but he had many brothers who were also soldiers. Between them, the Orlovs were the kings of the barracks. With Catherine, one can never separate the personal from the political, and she would have been very aware that one of the things that made Orlov was attractive, attractive was not just his fantastic physique, um, and cheerful nature, but also the fact that he might well turn out to be the key to the vital guards regiments who guarded the imperial family. Orlov and his guards soon proved their worth. June 1762, Peter ordered Catherine to go to Peterhof, a royal palace on the coast. He was to follow in a day or so. The rumour spread that he was planning to have his wife arrested and locked away in a convent. It was time for Catherine to act. If the coup had gone wrong, all the, the participants in it would have suffered grievously. All the Orloffs and the guardsmen would have been killed horribly. You know, if a politician loses today, he loses his seat, then you lost your head. You know, the stakes were vastly higher. Catherine perhaps would have been murdered, but would certainly have been locked in, an, in a nunnery monastery prison or something for the rest of her life, and probably would have been murdered there. The Orlov brothers organised the coup. Whilst Catherine slept at Peterhof, the troops were assembled. On June the 28th, 1762, she was awoken early by one of the Orlov brothers. Time to rise, he told her. Everything is in place to proclaim you. A coach stood ready to hurry them back to St. Petersburg and the waiting regiments. My dear, I am about to seize the throne of Russia. What on earth shall I wear? And she understood that performance was terribly important. And that was part of the reason why, when they were galloping back to St. Petersburg, when they stopped another carriage going the other way, and it turned out to contain Michelle, her French hairdresser, they recruited Michelle, the hairdresser, and he rode back with them and did her hair on the way to the revolution. By the time the coach reached St. Petersburg, Catherine was already being hailed as the Empress of all the Russias. Thanks to the Orlovs and their influence over the guards, it was a bloodless coup. 
Crowds cheered madly and soldiers dutifully swore allegiance to their new sovereign. But she still had to get rid of Peter. What she in fact chose to wear for the occasion was a fetching green uniform, just right for leading the troops to topple your husband. In fact, Peter hardly bothered to put up a fight. Or, as someone commented, he gave up the throne like a child being sent to bed. Catherine had him imprisoned and put the Orloffs in charge of his personal safety. She did nothing actually to protect him. Uh, she could, for example, have helped him to, to go into exile. She didn't do so. But he had to be murdered, otherwise there would have been endless attempts at coup d'etats against her, and that was inevitable. Most people who have got to power uh, have a, a ruthless streak in them. Ah! And to have run Russia during that period, you had to be exceptionally determined. When he was murdered, Catherine uh, organised that there be a press release, or the equivalent thereof, to say that the former emperor had died of hemorrhoids, and this caused much amusement in uh, Europe, uh, where she was immediately known as a, as a cruel regicide who'd killed her own husband, in effect. Um, but um, one of the French philo philosophes always said that he would never go to Russia because um, he had hemorrhoids, and in Russia, hemorrhoids could be a fatal disease. Catherine was 33 when she seized the throne, and she gave herself the most expensive and extravagant coronation possible. Her message was clear. She was now the official and legitimate Empress of Russia, and she was here to stay. I wanted to drag Russia out of her medieval stupor into the modern world. In a word, I wanted a revolution. Catherine immediately set about writing a landmark blueprint on how to rule Russia. What is the true end of monarchy? Not to deprive people of their natural liberty, but to correct their actions in order to attain the supreme good. There's an immense sense of self-belief. There's a belief that she can change Russia. It's a belief that's common to many rulers in the late 18th century. They can change society, change people's attitudes. The way that she actually chooses to operate is much gentler, much more careful, much more humane in many ways than most of her previous uh, predecessors and indeed for that matter successors. Chapter 10, Criminal Courts. The torture of the rack is a cruelty established and made use of by many nations. The innocent ought not to be tortured and in the eye of the law, every person is innocent whose crime is not yet proved. She rendered it less of a military dictatorship. She civilianized the whole thing and made it more gracious, more polite. Chapter 19, Education. Everyone ought to instill in the tender minds of children all those virtues and qualities which join to form a good education. She set up a system of free schooling that was open to all, boys and girls, a hugely progressive step for the times. In all the regulations for her school, no corporal punishment, black and white. Well, not in England, not in Germany, not in France. You know, I mean, these are the kind of things where I find that she is ahead. Catherine published her thoughts as her great instruction. No Russian monarch had ever written anything like this before. She then had it printed in numerous different languages, so that the whole of Europe would see what an enlightened and forward-thinking ruler Russia now had. In her own court, too, Catherine made life more civilized. She was going through the palace one day, 
and went through a room in which there was a soldier on guard and he had been sitting down and he just leapt up in a state of confusion, you know, being caught uh, like this off guard by the Empress herself. And she sort of said, don't worry, don't worry, and said, what are you doing? And she said, he said, oh, well, I'm reading, Your Majesty. Oh, said she, and she proceeded to discuss what he was reading. And within two days, she had organized a palace library for the palace servants. Her ladies-in-waiting remembered that once they called for their food and they said, bring me out my soup, and when the soup arrived, they noticed on the hand that brought it a huge diamond solitaire glistening um, next to the soup plate. And they looked up and it was the Empress herself. So in private life, she was very modest with the people around and very kind. Alongside the vast Winter Palace, she built a smaller, more intimate venue where she could entertain her closest friends and came up with a set of rules for guests to observe. Rule 1. All ranks shall be left outside the doors, similarly hats and particularly swords. Rule 2. Orders of precedence and haughtiness and anything of such like which might result from them shall be left at the doors. She even banished servants from dinner parties so that everyone could gossip and chat without fear of being overheard. Instead, dining tables were raised into the room from below by a system of pulleys. Everyone could speak freely. And in return for truthfulness to her, all her advisers were encouraged to speak the truth, speak up and be precise. She offered loyalty to her advisers and to her, uh, her ministers. I name you Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> Your Majesty overwhelms me. Russia was stable. You know, it lasted. You, if you woke up today, it was the same as it was yesterday. Can a man love a woman like me? Politics can be an extremely lonely profession and uh, nearer you get to the top the more lonely it becomes because you will only ever have one or two people uh, in whom you repose total confidence. Can a man love a woman like me? Catherine, I think, needed companionship constantly. She needed someone there. Several people at the time commented on this. They noticed that she didn't like to be left on her own. Even if there was only a dog or something in the room, she, she, it mattered her, to her not to be left uh, alone. For the first ten years of her reign, Gregory Orlov remained Catherine's lover. But as the years went on, cracks began to appear in their relationship. He was certainly no intellectual match for the Empress, and when she discovered that he'd been unfaithful, Catherine showed him the door, then cast her eye around. She needed a man. Uh, and I think that's, in a way, but she didn't need him only just, so to speak, for sex. She needed him for company, for affection, for shared interests, for shared artistic interests, and in some cases, shared political interests. Enter Potemkin. Soldier extraordinaire, the man who was to become the centre of Catherine's world. In reality, Catherine would have been standing on tiptoes to kiss Potemkin, as he was a giant of a man. He was extraordinary in every way. Apart from being immensely tall and broad, highly energetic, he... Um, defied all convention. Catherine would quite often be talking to a foreign ambassador when the door would open without any uh, warning at all and this giant wearing nothing but pantaloons from Turkey and a fur-lined dressing gown and a red bandana would wander through the throne room chewing on a radish and go out the other door completely ignoring the Empress of all the Russias. Oh, Monsieur Potemkin, what a trick you have played to unbalance a mind previously thought to be one of the finest in Europe. It is time, high time, 
for me to become reasonable. What a shame, what a sin, Catherine II to be the victim of this crazy passion. She was addicted to him at that time. Sometimes the Empress of all the Russias would creep down to Potemkin's apartments to wait outside, hoping that he would send away his boon companions with whom he was playing bridge. And she would wait there in the chilly draught. And this woman, remember, was the most powerful woman in the world. The doors will be open. I'm going to bed. Darling, I will do whatever you command. Shall I come to you or will you come to me? Like emails between couples today, Catherine and Potemkin use letters to share their thoughts and moods. These letters really live, but not only do they show enormous um, sexual and personal passion, they were also highly political, and very few letters would pass without some reference to politics. Other times they spoke in sort of childish love language. One, one letter I remember of hers reads, Me love General, General loves me? Question mark. Potemkin was far more to Catherine than a lover. He was her right-hand man, her empire builder. She made him head of the army, and together they brought about the vast expansion of the Russian Empire that marked Catherine's reign. In the 18th century, the ruler's success was measured by the size of their army, the size of their empire, and their population. Catherine was very aware of this. She was quite shamelessly an imperialist. <laughs> She took vast chunks of land from Poland, pushing Russia's borders as far as Austria. To the south, she brought towns, agriculture and modernization. She annexed the Crimea from Turkey, giving Russia territory on the Black Sea and with it vital trade routes through to the Mediterranean. This resulted in a huge growth in Russian power and really Russia's arrival as one of the true great powers of Europe. Much of this could not have been achieved without Potemkin. Love, politics, gossip was fused in this remarkable partnership. They would make love, then immediately switch to him imitating some courtier and they would roar with laughter and then suddenly they would move to changing the foreign policy from, from a Prussian alliance to an Austrian alliance. Many of her decisions were joint decisions, and decisions achieved only after great rows, great stomping, great arguments that no one else could have had with her. Imagine that the Crimea is yours. Gracious lady, you are obliged to raise Russian glory. Believe me, doing this will win you immortal glory, greater than any Russian sovereign ever. But Catherine wasn't able to marry the love of her life. Having murdered her first husband and the rightful heir to the throne, marrying again was considered politically disastrous and would risk everything. So it's believed that Catherine and Potemkin married in secret. Legend has it that they stole away one night to the church of St. Samsonovsky in St. Petersburg and exchanged their vows by candlelight in front of a nameless priest. They loved each other for the rest of their lives. Once the physical passion between them abated, they both enjoyed lovers freely, but no one would ever take Potemkin's place completely in her heart. A Chinese mirror arrived at Catherine's court one day. Intricately made entirely from silver, it was a hugely lavish piece of work. But obviously when it arrived in Russia, this was just not grand enough. So they splattered it with diamonds. You've got vast diamonds spread all around the frame. You've got added little pots of pearl and diamond flowers. Totally changed, but changed into Russian, spectacular, magnificent taste. Even by the standards of Tsarist Russia, Catherine was extravagant. 
she was determined to spend the country into the big league of Europe. Budgets were irrelevant. Her legacy to Russia today is one of the world's largest and most impressive art collections. Catherine's expenditure on palaces, on collections of Western art, on almost everything, in fact, is really quite extraordinary. Her court consumed up to something approaching 12% of the national budget at its highest. So it's, it's a very large expenditure. She understood what was good, she understood what was the best, and she got it. It was very significant that she should have bought in England the collection of Britain's first prime minister, Robert Walpole. Um, you know, she took from Britain what was arguably going to become the, sort, the core of our National Gallery, she took it to Russia instead. Um, and she did the same in France. She bought the Crozat collection, which is the most magnificent private collection in France, and fearful outrage that she should have bought it. Catherine would stop at little to acquire the world's most celebrated artworks. After seeing pictures of Raphael's frescoes in the Vatican, she decided that she wanted them in her own palace. So she dispatched an artist to Italy to copy them and employed an architect to recreate the gallery just as it was in Rome. And so back came precise copies of Raphael's frescoes. But naturally they didn't all fit. <laughs> so that there was sort of agonizing, snipping off here and adding a little bit there. But um, the result, the final result, is extraordinary. And it is there in St. Petersburg, a repetition of um, what Catherine had admired so much in Rome. Besides the paintings and the Raphael Loggia, my museum in the Hermitage contains 38,000 books. There are four rooms filled with books and prints, 10,000 engraved gems, roughly 10,000 drawings, and a natural history collection that fills two large galleries. Catherine's collecting was obsessive, and to house it all, she had to keep With each new extension, her palace snaked further along the river Neva. Today, the Hermitage Museum has ten kilometers of galleries. Architecture was another personal obsession, and a few favored architects were commissioned repeatedly. As soon as one project was finished, another was begun. The money at Catherine's court came directly from the peasantry, um, from, the, from the serfs themselves who paid all sorts of taxes. So it wasn't right that she was so extravagant, but it was very much of its time. Catherine was a very clever, calculating um, monarch who um, knew all the tricks about how to impress her fellow sovereigns around Europe. The traditional view of Russia in the West was that it was a benighted, rough, uh, rude country full of uneducated people uh, who, who behaved literally like bears. So Catherine had to try to overcome that image to demonstrate that Russia was a great power culturally as well as militarily. People came to Catherine's court because it was highly intelligent, wonderful art collections. It demonstrated that her empire was actually more important than the British Empire, to the French that she was more magnificent than all their Louis, so that she knew just what she was doing in how she bought and on what scale. she was a real sexy beast and that is wonderful because the traditional view of women still today is that women are either mothers or their wives or their virgins or nuns or something inappropriately limiting and the idea of having a big strong powerful sexy lady really sets the men by their heels doesn't it In her open marriage with Potemkin, Catherine took up with a series of lovers, seven in all. As she grew older, they got younger. 
often guardsmen, they were usually good-looking, but never her intellectual equal. Bizarrely, these young men were often chosen by Potemkin himself, and then became part of a curious love triangle with the Empress and her husband. Male um, leaders for centuries have seen it as their absolute right to pluck some youngster from the ranks and sort of say, you know, this is not only your duty but your great honour to lie down with me. Um, I see no reason why Catherine shouldn't have really felt the same. This is one of the privileges of her court position. Furthermore, they would then become favourites. They'd be her protégé. She'd bring them on. It's a real time-honoured career move for young people everywhere. The young men at court knew that she was looking for a companion and one memoir says that when she went into church all the young men would straighten themselves up and desperately try to catch her eye as she walked um, down towards the altar, knowing as they did that she was very bored by church services, incidentally. Catherine's affairs were conducted openly and each new lover became an accepted part of life at court. They would accompany the Empress at public occasions, and many evenings would join her for cards. Then, at around 11 o'clock, retire with her to the bedchamber. I think most women today would envy her a little bit. They, they would certainly envy her energy and her appetite. What I find amazing is she was doing all this after a full day's work. Uh, I mean, I know, I know she didn't have to do the washing up, but nonetheless, she was a busy lady. And uh, to keep these chaps happy uh, right through the night, or have them keep her happy, uh, must have been quite a feat. Being the lover of one of the richest women in the world was an immensely profitable profession, and Catherine was extremely generous. The favourites were blessed with vast amounts of money and gifts. She built Potemkin the magnificent Torida Palace in St. Petersburg. Potemkin, after about two years as her lover, was probably one of the richest men in Europe. Richer, they said, than some crowned heads themselves. Orlov had the Marble Palace, the most expensive building in the city. And another lover had his own residence beside hers in the country. Being a lover of Catherine the Great, at that court was in fact, despite being very profitable in terms of the fact that they became immensely rich, it was also incredibly boring for a young man. After all, they were companions to a breathless, corpulent lady in her late 50s, early 60s. Catherine appeared to be genuinely in love with each and every one of these young men. But of all the favourites of her later years, there was one whom she loved with a special passion and who adored her in return. Sasha Lanskoy was 20 years old when the 51-year-old Empress plucked him from the ranks. Lanskoy was the most angelic of her young lovers and the one she was happiest with. He comes across as a very sweet young man and he loved Catherine and he also loved Potemkin despite some tensions with him and so all was happy and I think that the three of them would have lived together in their bizarre menage a trois for all time. And he dies after four years. And she is heartbroken. She weeps and she wails and she writes to her great friend in Paris, Baron Grimm, you know, and you, you get all this straight from her. I am plunged in the utmost misery and my happiness is gone. He worked, he learnt, he had acquired all my tastes. I was bringing up this young man. I hoped that he would be the support of my old age. In a word, I weep and must tell you that General Lanskoy is dead. In the early hours of July the 24th, 1791, Potemkin set off from Catherine's country estate. As he galloped away, heading for the south, the Empress wrote him a note that said, Goodbye, my friend. I kiss you. She never saw him again. He was struck by a fever and died on a desolate hillside in Moldova, with Catherine's letters in his pocket, stained by his tears.
Catherine arguably never recovered from Potemkin's death. She collapsed on hearing the news and locked herself away. She felt there was no replacement for him, and she would often go and live in his house or walk in his gardens and say, there's something missing here. Her reign was now past its glory days. In the last five years of her life, the court was dominated by her vain and fairly limited and quite stupid lover, Zuboff. Platon Zuboff was almost 40 years younger than Catherine, and for the aging empress his youth and energy seemed more important than his ability. He was said to be haughty and arrogant and an anti-intellectual. And I think there's a sort of sense that she's losing her grip by this point. These are, of course, after 1789, the years of the French Revolution, which, though they don't necessarily pose a challenge to Russian power in the East, certainly pose a challenge to the kind of world of order ideas and hierarchy in which Catherine has operated previously. So there's a sense in which her world no longer looks quite the same as it had done. She was immensely shocked by the execution of the French king in 1793. It's supposed to have made her physically sick. She was no longer in tune with events that were taking place in Europe. Catherine died on November the 5th, 1796, from a stroke. She collapsed in the water closet of her private apartments, and when they found her, it took six men to move her body into the bedroom. She was aged 67, and had ruled Russia for 34 years, one of the longest reigns of any Tsar. She's just flung it in my face that she's had 17 lovers in two years! 70? No, 17! Catherine always wanted a place in history, but her reputation has been as much notorious as glorious. In her own lifetime, she was mocked for an unseemly appetite for power and sex, and since then the stories have grown wilder and her reputation more scarlet. She has documented lovers, it's very easy for enemies to throw in another couple of hundred and with that suggestion that you know her honour isn't really um, intact, you can then suggest that in fact she's devious, she's manipulative because if she does this with men, what on earth will she do with her political power? That must also be corrupt. The most outrageous story about Catherine that circulates to this day gives an extraordinary version of her death, involving a horse. Her Excellency had gone in straight after I had finished setting up. And the funny thing was that I don't think she had anything on underneath her fur coat. Well, I was just about to go for a slash when there was this almighty crash from the stable. I ran over and threw open the top half of the door, only to see the supreme ruler of all Russia spread-eagled, stark naked and squashed to a pulp underneath a fully grown half-ton stallion. It probably arose amongst troops. It's, it's a soldier's story, almost certainly. Some are inclined to ascribe it to Finns or to Poles, in other words, not to Russians. But it is a gruesome story. It's so extraordinary that it sticks in people's minds. It's probably the first thing that most people will tell you about Catherine the Great that they know. It's a question I'm often asked, is it true? No, it isn't. It's 
rather a shame. About this incredibly thoughtful, intellectual, powerful lady who really changed the landscape of Russia. That what you know about her, so the first thing that comes to mind is that she might have had congress with a horse. <laughs> if you said, "Tell us what Catherine the Great did," I don't think people would talk about getting land from the Ukraine, would they? They're far more likely to talk about the, the raft of lovers. Is that how she really wanted to be remembered? She had twelve lovers, which is a fairly modest sex life by many contemporary standards. But she was unlucky in that her history was written in the nineteenth century, which is about as prudish as any century can be in this respect. She was passionate. There's no doubt about it. But no, she was never an infomaniac, and no one who knows anything about Catherine the Great would say that she was. We should remember Catherine as a ruler who brought humanity and tolerance to Russia, and that's what she should be remembered for. She even banished servants from dinner parties so that everyone could gossip and chat without fear of being overheard. Instead, dining tables were raised into the room from below by a system of pulleys. Everyone could speak freely. And in return for truthfulness to her, all her advisers were encouraged to speak the truth, speak up, and be precise. She offered loyalty to her advisers and to her uh, her ministers. I name you Vice Chancellor. <laughs> Your Majesty overwhelms me. Russia was stable, you know. It lasted. You, if you woke up today, it was the same as it was yesterday. Can a man love a woman like me? Politics can be an extremely lonely profession, and the nearer you get to the top, the more lonely it becomes, because you. Will only ever have one or two people uh, in whom you repose total confidence. Can a man love a woman like me? Catherine, I think, needed companionship constantly. She needed someone there. Several people at the time. <laughs> He hated Russian traditions and Russian culture. He made no effort to learn Russian. He made no effort to make himself popular at court. She was careful to learn Russian to win the sympathy of the domestic staff that she had to deal with in the palace. Peter too had grown up in Germany, but he clung to his roots and his Lutheran religion. Catherine embraced Russia completely by converting to Orthodoxy and taking a new Russian name, Ekaterina. In spite of being totally unsuited, the couple did as they were told and tied the knot. They set up home in Peter's country palace. Their wedding night set the tone for the emotional wilderness that Catherine's marriage turned out to be. She waited in her bed for her husband to come. He never did, and she could hear him carousing downstairs with his friends. He was every woman's nightmare, I think. He was thoroughly immature and unaware of the effects of his actions on other people, and the first person affected was Catherine herself. In front of a nameless priest, they loved each other for the rest of their lives. Once the physical passion between them abated, they both enjoyed lovers freely, but no one would ever take Potemkin's place completely in her heart. A Chinese mirror arrived at Catherine's court one day, intricately made entirely from silver. It was a hugely lavish piece of work. 
But obviously when it arrived in Russia, this was just not grand enough. So they splattered it with diamonds. You've got vast diamonds spread all around the frame. You've got added little pots of pearl and diamond flowers. Totally changed, but changed into Russian spectacular, magnificent taste. Even by the standards of Tsarist Russia, Catherine was extravagant. She was determined to spend the country into the big league of Europe. Budgets were irrelevant. Her legacy to Russia today is one of the world's largest and most impressive art collections. A vain and fairly limited and quite stupid lover, Zuboff. Platon Zuboff was almost 40 years younger than Catherine, and for the aging empress his youth and energy seemed more important than his ability. He was said to be haughty and arrogant and an anti-intellectual. And I think there's a sort of sense that she's losing her grip by this point. These are, of course, after 1789, the years of the French Revolution, which, though they don't necessarily pose a challenge to Russian power in the East, certainly pose a challenge to the kind of world of order ideas and hierarchy in which Catherine has operated previously. So there's a sense in which her world no longer looks quite the same as it had done. She was immensely shocked by the execution of the French king in 1793. It's supposed to have made her physically sick. She was no longer in tune with events that were taking place in Europe. Catherine died on November the 5th, 1796, from a stroke. She collapsed in the water closet of her private apartments, and when they found her, it took six men to move her body into the bedroom. She was aged 67, and had ruled Russia for 34 years, one of the longest reigns of any Tsar. Thrin that circulates to this day gives an extraordinary version of her death, involving a horse. Her Excellency had gone in straight after I had finished setting up. And the funny thing was that I don't think she had anything on underneath her fur coat. Well, I was just about to go for a slash when there was this almighty crash from the stable. I ran over and threw open the top half of the door only to see the supreme ruler of all Russia spread eagled, start naked and squashed to a pulp underneath a fully grown half-ton stallion. It probably arose amongst troops. It's, it's a soldier's story, almost certainly. Some are inclined to ascribe it to Finns or to Poles, in other words, not to Russians. But it is a gruesome story. It's so extraordinary that it sticks in people's minds. It's probably the first thing that most people will tell you about Catherine the Great that they know. It's a question I'm often asked, is it true? No, it isn't. It's rather a shame about this incredibly thoughtful, intellectual, powerful lady who really changed the landscape of Russia. That what you Thought consumed up to something approaching 12% of the national budget at its highest. So it's, it's a very large expenditure. She understood what was good, she understood what was the best, and she got it. It was very significant that she should have bought in England the collection of Britain's first prime minister, Robert Walpole, um, you know, she took from Britain what was arguably going to become the, sort, the core of our national gallery, she took it to Russia instead. Um, and she did the same in France. She bought the Crozat collection, which is the most magnificent private collection in France, and fearful outrage that she should have bought it. Catherine would stop at little to acquire the world's most celebrated artworks. After seeing pictures of Raphael's frescoes in the Vatican, she decided that she wanted them in her own palace. So she dispatched an artist to Italy to copy them and employed an architect to recreate the gallery just as it was in Rome. And 
and so back came precise copies of Raphael's frescoes. But naturally, they didn't all fit. <laughs> so that there was sort of agonizing, snipping off here and adding a little bit there. But um, the result, the final result, is extraordinary. And it is there in St. Petersburg, a repetition of um, what Catherine had admired. Peter ordered Catherine to go to Peterhof, a royal palace on the coast. He was to follow in a day or so. The rumor spread that he was planning to have his wife arrested and locked away in a convent. It was time for Catherine to act. If the coup had gone wrong, all the, the participants in it would have suffered grievously. All the Olofs and the guardsmen would have been killed horribly. You know, if a politician loses today, he loses his seat, then you lost your head. You know, the stakes were vastly higher. Catherine perhaps would have been murdered, but would certainly have been locked in, an, in a nunnery monastery prison or something for the rest of her life, and probably would have been murdered there. The Orlov brothers organized the coup. Whilst Catherine slept at Peterhof, the troops were assembled. On June the 28th, 1762, she was awoken early by one of the Orlov brothers. Time to rise, he told her. Everything is in place to proclaim you. A coach stood ready to hurry them back to St. Petersburg and the waiting regiments. My dear, I am about to seize the throne of Russia. What on earth should... But he had to be murdered, otherwise there would have been endless attempts at coup d'etats against her, and that was inevitable. Most people who have got to power uh, have a, a ruthless streak in them. Ah! And to have run Russia during that period, you had to be exceptionally determined. When he was murdered, Catherine uh, organised that there be a press release, or the equivalent thereof, to say that the former emperor had died of hemorrhoids. And this caused much amusement in uh, Europe. Uh, where she was immediately known as a, as a cruel regicide who'd killed her own husband, in effect. Um, but um, one of the French philo philosophes always said that he would never go to Russia because um, he had hemorrhoids, and in Russia, hemorrhoids could be a fatal disease. Catherine was 33 when she seized the throne, and she gave herself the most expensive and extravagant coronation possible. Her message was clear. She was now the official and legitimate Empress of Russia, and she was here to stay. I wanted to drag Russia out of her medieval stupor into the modern world. In a word, I wanted a revolution. He developed very early on the kind of political skills that were to prove extremely useful to her when she came to the throne. The ability to juggle one faction against another, to balance one advisor against another. Most of all, she knew how to charm. Oh boy, didn't she? All the descriptions of her. Her charm, her kindness. She would give her hand to somebody. She would raise them. She would embrace and kiss them on both cheeks. Mwah, mwah. Oh my. I persisted more and more in my desire to win the affection of the unimportant as well as of the great, neglecting no one and making it a rule to believe that I needed everybody. Accordingly, I behaved in such a way as to win general approval, and in this I succeeded. I came to tell you that the Empress is dead. Dead. Finished. 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 Grand Duke Peter finally got his hands on the throne in 1761. The last person he wanted at his side was his clever, popular wife. There were rumours of divorce.
Catherine died on November the 5th, 1796, from a stroke. She collapsed in the water closet of her private apartments, and when they found her, it took six men to move her body into the bedroom. She was aged 67 and had ruled Russia for 34 years, one of the longest reigns of any Tsar. Seventeen lovers in two years! Seventy? No, seventeen! Catherine always wanted a place in history, but her reputation has been as much notorious as glorious. In her own lifetime, she was mocked for an unseemly appetite for power and sex, and since then the stories have grown wilder and her reputation more scarlet. She has documented lovers, it's very easy for enemies to throw in another couple of hundred and with that suggestion that, you know, her honour isn't really... Many of her decisions were joint decisions and decisions achieved only after great rows, great stomping, great arguments that no one else could have had with her. Imagine that the Crimea is yours. Gracious lady, you are obliged to raise Russian glory. Believe me, doing this will win you immortal glory, greater than any Russian sovereign ever. But Catherine wasn't able to marry the love of her life. Having murdered her first husband and the rightful heir to the throne, marrying again was considered politically disastrous and would risk everything. So it's believed that Catherine and Potemkin married in secret. Legend has it that they stole away one night to the church of St. Samsonovsky in St. Petersburg and exchanged their vows by candlelight in front of a nameless priest. They loved each other for the rest of their lives. Once the physical passion between them abated, they both enjoyed lovers freely, but no one would ever take Potemkin's place completely in her heart. A Chinese mirror arrived at Catherine's court one day, intricately made entirely... Did Catherine uh, organised that there be a press release, or the equivalent thereof, to say that the former emperor had died of hemorrhoids. And this caused much amusement in uh, Europe, uh, where she was immediately known as a, as a cruel regicide who'd killed her own husband, in effect. Um, but um, one of the French philo philosophes, always said that he would never go to Russia because um, he had hemorrhoids and in Russia hemorrhoids could be a fatal disease. Catherine was 33 when she seized the throne and she gave herself the most expensive and extravagant coronation possible. Her message was clear. She was now the official and legitimate empress of Russia and she was here to stay. wanted to drag Russia out of her medieval stupor into the modern world. In a word, I wanted a revolution. Catherine immediately set about writing a landmark blueprint on how to rule Russia. What is the true end of monarchy? Not to deprive people of their natural liberty, but to correct their actions in order to attain the supreme good. Russia was stable. You know, it lasted. You, if you woke up today, it was the same as it was yesterday. Can a man love a woman like me? Politics can be an extremely lonely profession, and... Uh, nearer you get to the top the more lonely it becomes because you will only ever have one or two people uh, in whom you repose total confidence can a man love a woman like me Catherine I 
think, needed companionship constantly. She needed someone there. Several people at the time commented on this. They noticed that she didn't like to be left on her own. Even if there was only a dog or something in the room, she, she, it mattered her, to her not to be left uh, alone. For the first ten years of her reign, Gregory Orlov remained Catherine's lover. But as the years went on, cracks began to appear in their relationship. He was certainly no intellectual match for the Empress, and when she discovered that he'd been unfaithful, Catherine showed him the door, then cast her eye around. She needed a man, uh, and I think that's, in a way, but 